Uh, today we are here with uh, Mr. Iftika Ahmed. What we are looking at today, we are looking at his uh, autobiography, uh, the memo and everything. So without wasting much of your time, we're going to go straight into the questions. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good. Uh, going straight into your memo, which you wrote about yourself and your family, I want to ask you why the first two chapters of your memo you have written about your parents. What made you start with your parents? Well, the two most important people in my life is my father and my mother. You know, I miss them every day. My father died in 1995. My mother passed away three years after that. But still, I haven't overcome that pain. So every day, you know, I miss them. When I get up in the morning, I have their picture in my bedroom wall. I look at my parents' photo and I pray for them. When I go out of the house, I look at my parents' picture, then I pray and then I go out. When I come back, again look at the picture of my parents, again seek their blessing. So. Constantly I feel that although I'm staying alone, I feel that my father, mother, they're watching me and they're praying for me. So I've been very blessed to have such loving and caring parents. You know, I mean, they brought us up. I have three, three other brothers. Uh, they put us in very good school. My father, he was a very successful banker. Uh, I've seen him struggle. Uh, when he was uh, working for National Bank of Pakistan, he was posted as a branch manager in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, he was the first Bengali to be given a foreign assignment. So he ended his career being the deputy governor of Bangladesh Bank. And uh, when Bangladesh became independent, uh, Bongo Bondhu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman, our father of the nation, appointed him as the managing director of Krishi Bank, which is an agriculture bank, the bank which gives credit to small scale uh, farmers uh, and people uh, with very limited source of income. So, my father has done a lot to bring that agriculture bank now where it is. And about my mother, what can I say? She had education maybe up to class eight, but she was well read. She used to read a lot. And she was also very fond of music. And uh, when I got married to Renata, my ex-wife, uh, she hailed from Poland. So my mother even learned English and it could speak very fluently so that she can communicate with her daughter-in-law. So my, my father was very warm, loving, caring person. You know, I, she was my best friend. Uh, I could talk to my mother almost anything under the sun. My father was a little bit introvert. You know, he had difficulty in expressing himself. Uh, but my mother was just my friend. You know? I mean, I confided her with almost everything. So I miss them, believe me or not. And my father was my role model, you know. Uh, he was a very honest man. Uh, he used to help people who had any problem, you know. He, he loved to take, uh, help people and make them feel good, you know. Bring a smile on somebody's face. And that is something that I have also inherited, you know. Uh, because, you know, we, we live in this world for a very short time. Today we live, tomorrow we go, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So, I'm, I'm very proud that today I am here, I have accomplished a lot of things in my life, but the training I received from my parents, uh, I have tried to um, keep those uh, values, you know, self-respect and dignity, you know, uh, it's more important than money. Money you can have today, tomorrow you may not have money. But once you lose self-respect and dignity, 
that's it. You can't get it back. So I tell my children the same thing, you know. Life is too short, make best use of your time. Treat everybody equally, regardless of their faith, regardless of their uh, nationality. Uh, I could sit and dine with a Hindu, with a Christian, with a Jew, even with an atheist, no problem. I'm very open-minded because we all belong to one race and that is human race. Religion is a personal thing, you know. I don't have to become an exhibitionist to say that I am a Muslim. It's not written on my face, on my forehead. So, for me, my father and mother, they were the two people that I look up, even today. And I will say one more thing, that God, you know, uh, after God, parents are the most important people. Without receiving the blessing of your parents, I cannot go to heaven. So I am blessed, you know. And I, I wish I uh, live in this world with self-respect and dignity. Well, that's good, Ifchika. We actually appreciate that you take the role of your parents very important, which is what actually everyone is meant to do in life. So you have to carry on that. Uh, moving on with you, with you here, you were born in Bangladesh in a Red Cross hospital. Please tell me something about your childhood. Ah, yeah, I was born in Barisal, which is a town in Bangladesh, uh, and I was born in a Red Cross hospital. And uh, when I was born, my father, he put this out uh, in, in the newspaper in uh, Calcutta Statesman, uh, in the birth column, you know, and I still have the clipping with me all these years. Uh, so you must have been very happy that I was born and uh, I was the first child. Uh, none of my other brothers got a nickname, but I have a nickname, Babu. Uh, so Babu uh, is my nickname. They call me Babu at home. Uh, Babu means uh, the perfumed one. And my name, Iftikhar Ahmed, also has meaning because these names are from uh, the Holy Quran. It's uh, Arabic names. Uh, we all Muslims have Arabic names. Iftikhar means somebody who has pride, and Ahmed means beloved of God. So I have a pride. I don't know, maybe the name has made me feel like that. Schooling, I went to a convent school run by the American nuns. And uh, I was in a boarding school. You see, most of my life I stayed away from home. I was in a hostel, in a boarding school. And uh, later on when I went to university, I went to Karachi University. So again I stayed away from home. Then I went, when I came to this country to study English uh, language, uh, literature, again I stayed away from home. So, this is my childhood, you know, my childhood was always trying to explore something new, you know. And it's very exciting. Very exciting, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I had a good, good childhood, I must say. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, what is there is like, uh, uh, when I look at the history in your memo, like uh, the time you actually went to Karachi University, that was the time of the split of Pakistan into two parts. Can you elaborate a little bit about that to us, please? Oh, yes. The problems you encountered. Yeah. Yeah, there was this military crackdown. General Yahya Khan, who was then the dictator of Pakistan, and he started this military operation in the then East Pakistan. I was uh, stuck in Karachi. So, for the entire duration of the war, I was a student at Karachi University, but uh, personally I did not experience any problem while I was there because people there, they thought that I must be a real Pakistani, that's why I came to Karachi, and I was. I had no idea that uh, within one year this uh, liberation war will start. Uh, General Yahya Khan uh, had about 90,000 soldiers in East Pakistan. And many, many Bengalis were killed 
women were raped. It was a genocide. You know. And if it was not for India, if it was not for Mrs. Indira Gandhi, Bangladesh would not have been uh, independent so soon. We would have to wait like Vietnam for 19 years. So within the span of one year, even less than one year, our uh, freedom fighters, with the help of the Indian Armed Forces, Bangladesh was liber liberated. But at Karachi University, I was elected uh, in my class, a class representative. There was a girl who also stood against me, and I beat her. Because in my class, I had uh, more girls than boys. So we were eight boys, and there was about 20 or 30 girls. So that says a lot that, you know, the, the students, they, don't, they didn't take me that look, I'm a Bengali or no, no. They thought that I was, I was a Pakistani, I was a normal, uh, popular, popular uh, student in my class, you know. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's uh, so good about your education. And moving on, when you finished your education, you actually got mature and became a man and you started a family. But uh, when I look at you into your mama again, I see that you got married to your ex-wife was uh, an, a Polish lady. Can you actually debrief us um, your encounter where you met this woman and how you went, uh, you marrying into a different culture from yours, uh, the experiences you encountered in life? Yeah, my ex-wife was from Poland, uh, Renata. I met her uh, when I was working, um, while a student, I was working part-time uh, in a bed and breakfast hotel in, in near Marble Arch. And uh, one day there was a knock on the door and I opened the door and, and there was this young girl. And I said, what can I do for you? She said, no, I have come for an interview. I said, okay, come on in. And within two months, we started dating each other, you know, we started dating and uh, then, you know, you work with somebody for long hours and stayed together. We stayed in the same uh, hotel also. And uh, from likeness, it became love, you know, and uh, we had no problem. And then I was married, as you know, uh, you've read, for 23 years I was married. I have three children grown up children now. So when I took Renata to Bangladesh, uh, in, in those days, you know, mixed marriages uh, were novelty. Yeah, not many people married abroad, you know. But I was one of the very few who started marrying a foreigner. So Renata also made herself very comfortable. She learned Bengali. She, she knew how to cook uh, our curry. And she loved chicken birani, mutton birani. When I was in the hotel in London, I used to bring uh, this food from the restaurant and she liked it so much. Then maybe she told herself, why not marry this man? <laughs> then I can have this every day. So she, she, she spoke fluent Bengali. And uh, even in Bangladesh, when I used to go to market, she, she knew how to bargain, you know. Uh, so she know that you, in, in our country there's bargaining, nothing is fixed, <laughs> everything you can negotiate. So Renata learned all that it, and she was a very loving, loving um, mother, you know, very, very good mother. So I, for 23 years, you know, I, but sometimes in marriage, you know, things happen, you know, uh, sometimes the spark goes out, you know, and then I did not seek this divorce. She wanted it. So what, what, what could I have done, you know? But I have a good working relationship with her. I talk to her. Sometimes uh, we can meet also uh, for my birthday, for my children's birthday. We celebrate Eid, uh, Christmas together. Uh, so she's very caring for my children, you know. And still, uh, she, she, I don't have any um, grudge against her, you know. I wish her well. I mean, she married uh, recently, but I chose to remain single. <laughs> so in one way, you can say that I'm a happily divorced man. I don't, I don't know whether you've heard this phrase before. <laughs> yeah, exciting. 23 years is quite a long time. And uh, in those 23 years, 
uh, faith, culture, and religion was totally different. Yeah. yeah. So how did you copy? Yeah. That? Well, Renata <coughs> uh, converted herself to Islam. She didn't have to. I didn't force her. But she, on her own, said. No, I would like to become a Muslim. She was a Catholic, you know, in, in Poland, most, uh, the 99 percent of the population in Poland, they are uh, the Catholics. So she said, no, I want to. Then I said, well, let me talk to the priest. So in London, there is the central mosque at Regent's Park, the biggest mosque in this country. So we went and uh, we saw the imam, the priest. And uh, he said that, no, uh, you don't have to become a Muslim. To marry a Muslim, you can follow your faith, and still you can be married. But Renata said, "No, I want to become a Muslim." So the Imam gave her some books on Islam. She, he said to her, "You read these books, then come back after two months or three months. I will uh, ask you some things from the book, and then I will see whether you know you really uh, want to convert yourself." So that actually happened. So the, it was an Egyptian imam. So when we went after three months or so, uh, he asked her certain questions from the book to see that that she actually read it and that she knows what she's talking about. And then she he said, "Okay, I I can convert you." And you came up with the Academy of Performing Arts, uh, which is your brainchild. Can you briefly tell us how you actually came up with this? Yeah, the Academy of Performing Arts is my brainchild, and I set this up in 1995 with the sole aim is to uh, promote Indian classical music and dance for the benefit of the local population. Uh, because when people see Bollywood films, especially young people, they think that that is our culture. But unfortunately, it's not the case. Indian classical music and dance is our culture. Uh, and I wanted to uh, start this academy for better appreciation and better understanding of Indian classical music and dance. I had a school also, once a week. Students used to come to that school. And I had teachers who came from London, especially, for two hours. You know, we had classes, but it didn't take up, you know, because young people nowadays they don't have time or they, they have no interest for classical music, and because it, it, it's not so easy to learn Indian instruments or Indian dance. You know, classical dance is not so easy. Bollywood dance, anybody you can learn Bollywood dance in one day, two days, but classical dance, no way. To learn like sitar, it takes about twelve years. Violin, ten years. You know. Dance, Bharatanatyam, Kathak, it takes years of dedication. So, unfortunately, the academy I had to close down after a few years. But uh, I had success in promoting. I had artists coming uh, uh, from abroad, from India, uh, precisely, and I had the fortune to host uh, Ravi Shankar's concert, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan's concert. Could you tell me more about you hosting Ravi Shankar, Ali Akbar Khan and your collaboration with Jamin Krishnamurti? Jamini Krishnamurti, I know it's a very difficult name to pronounce, a South Indian name. Jamini Krishnamurti is, is, a, is a Bharatanatyam legend. Pandit Ravi Shankar, he was the face of Indian classical music. You know. Ravi Shankar, people know him all over the world. So it was a dream come true for me to hold Ravi Shankar's concert in Luton in, in 1999. And in the beginning, I thought, oh, I possibly I'm, I will not even get a date. So I approached his agent in London, tenant artist. They did not even bother to re respond to my letter. They thought, maybe, who is this? Then I got in touch with the publisher of Ravi Shankar's book, Raga. You know, I have a copy of that book. There were 300 copies worldwide and I have one copy, all 
signed by Ravi Shankar. And I told the publisher, uh, Oliver Chris, I think his name was, can you please forward my letter to Ravi Shankar because Ravi Shankar was staying in San Diego in America. So he said, okay, I can definitely forward that letter to you. He forwarded my letter to Ravi Shankar and within two weeks I got a call from the agents in London, tenant artists, that Mr. Ahmed, uh, when do you want to hold this concert? So that's how it started. So when I got the date, I was over the moon. And on the day of the concert, I, <laughs> it jumped back, you know, I did it in the sports complex, indoor complex, because the agent said that I must have capacity for three, 800 people. So in Luton, I did not have such a big auditorium. So I had to do it in an indoor stadium, uh, complex, sports complex. So I had to get everything from outside chairs, sound system, you know, everything. And thank goodness, it, I have to raise a lot of money. I'm not going to disclose the amount. It's a huge, huge, huge amount, you know. Uh, but uh, by the grace of God, I, I pull it off. Ali Akbar Khan is also a very, very famous um, Sarod player. And at one time, he was related to Ravi Shankar. You see, Ravi Shankar's guru, Stad Alauddin Khan, is the father of Ali Akbar Khan. And Ravi Shankar's first wife was the daughter of his Ustad, a guru. So they were like brother-in-law, you know. So Ali Akbar Khan also came from America. He was almost uh, nearly 80 when he came. He didn't want to come. He said, no, there is terrorist, terrorism in uh, London. But I said, there is more terrorism in America than in England. So I managed to bring him and he performed at the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London at the South Bank Center, which you know is a very prestigious venue. And it went off well. And then I also had the fortune to do a documentary on Jamini Krishnamurti. You know, I very fortunate she gave me a date. So we shot the film in her house and also she gave us some footage from some documentaries that she had done before. So for two days we went to our house and we did the shooting there. We also uh, did shooting of our students because she had a lot of students there. Uh, and they performed at the amphitheater uh, behind her house. So that was a big, big um, uh, satisfaction for me. Uh, Jamini Krishnamurti is a very, very famous uh, Bharatanatyam dancer. She was she received all the accolades that uh, that you can imagine. She had it. Yeah, you have watched the documentary as well. Uh, yeah, Rag, uh, yeah, Naktam, uh, Naktam. Dance is the way she teaches uh, yes. those yeah. young girls. And, and she, by the way, Adi, she never married. No. I asked her the question, why you did not get married? She said, no, I'm, if I got married, then I would not be able to pursue dancing, you know. Oh. So she she's married to her dance, you can say that way. You know? That's true. Yeah, you also invited the Bengali screen icon, Apana Seni, to appear at the National Film Theatre. This must have been a very exciting experience. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. You see, Apana Sen is a very, very famous screen icon from Kolkata. She's a director, actor, she's a journalist. I mean, she was editing a magazine called Shananda. So when I initially tried to contact her, uh, I asked one or two people, can you get in, get me in touch with Aparna Sen? They said, no, 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 no. She's very difficult women to uh, handle. I said, no, why? I just want to find out. Because I saw her film in, in Shatyajit Rai's uh, Tin Konna. And uh, I liked it so much. And I always thought that when can I meet this young lady, this act actor. So I went, I made an appointment, I telephoned her, she invited me to her office. I went and I saw her and I said, I would like you to come to England and I want to show one of your films. And that's how it started. And then uh, her latest film that time was Parumita uh, Din, which means House of Memories. So that film we showed at the National Film Theatre, which is the, the most famous cinema hall in the world, one might say. 
So I was very fortunate to make her appear at the uh, NFT. And also I did one show here in Luton at the Cine World. And after the show, she also, we had the question and answers session where audience could ask her questions and she would have, she, she answered them. So that was, so for two days I was with her. We stayed in the hotel in London, in the same hotel. And yeah, I got on well with her. I had no, no, no problem. But that was a big satisfaction, you know, because I'm a Bengali and she's also Bengali. So we Bengalis, <laughs> we are proud of our culture, you know. Uh, we don't think in terms of Hindu and Muslim and all that. No. We are Bengalis, you know. We are very, very proud of our language, you know. People died in 1952 in, in the East Pakistan. They gave their lives for the language because the Pakistan government, they wanted to make only Urdu, the national language of Pakistan. So we said, sorry, mate, no way. So the students of Dhaka University, they came out on the street and the police fired to stop the demonstration and four students lost their life, Salam, Barkat and two others. And every uh, year on 21st February, we observe this date. It's called Martyr's Day. And I think Bangladesh is the only country in the world where people gave their lives for their language. Can you imagine? For language. The Pakistan government, they said, no, you have to learn Urdu. I said, why? This is our language. So, like we have Tagore, the famous Bengali poet. He was the first Asian to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature, Tagore. And Tagore's uh, uh, poem uh, is the national anthem of Bangladesh. Tagore's poem is also the national anthem of India. Tagore's poem is also the national anthem of of Sri Lanka. So I am a Bengali, I'm a proud Bengali. Ravi Shankar, by the way, is, is Bengali. Ali Akbar Khan is a Bengali. So Bengal has produced, I think, most of the artists in India, uh, they all came from Bengal. Excellent. Well, you know, I was always interested in films, as I mentioned to you a little bit earlier. So even when I was in college, I had the opportunity to work for a Sunday Weekly. It was called Holiday. And I was the cultural correspondent for that newspaper. And I had the opportunity to interview the famous actor from Bangladesh, Kaburi, who recently sadly passed away uh, due to COVID. So I had interviewed her. I was possibly at 20 or so, very young. And she was also very young at that, that time. So I interviewed her in her house, and that was the highlight of my experience with Holiday. Good. You received a very prestigious award, Mother Teresa Lifetime Achievement Award. Can you please tell us the reason why this award was given to you? Yeah. When I received a phone call uh, from India that this charity, Mother Teresa International Award uh, Committee, they want to give me this award. I was uh, taken by surprise. But then when I went to Kolkata um, after I received the call, they said, uh, we would like to give you this award because you have done so much work for promoting Indian classical music and dance in UK. And uh, that is why we felt that we have to honor you. So that's how I came to know. And that was the reason. So today, you know, I can sit back and uh, say that, you know, I have received one of the highest accolades in any country. Mother Teresa, uh, she's an international brand. Everybody knows Mother Teresa. To have an award from that charity uh, is nothing like it, you know. And I'm really, really, I, I feel very fortunate, you know. God has been very kind to me, you know. I, uh, I never imagined, it was beyond my comprehension that one day I received Mother Teresa award, you know. So when the award was given, uh, it had to be done separately because the main award ceremony was done, I think, uh, three months before. I could not go there at that time. I did not have uh, that, uh, time. So they held a separate uh, ceremony uh, at a, uh, in, in the Kolkata Press Club, a very f famous venue. Kolkata Press Club is uh, British. Uh, it was set up during the British time. So they held this uh, function at the press club and I was given this uh, award in that uh, press club. Excellent. 
Uh, moving on with your life again, we see that uh, we had a lot of struggle coming up to life uh, to be whom we are today. Uh, you once stayed in Afghanistan, uh, from Bangladesh to Afghanistan. Then can you briefly tell us your journey? Yeah, Afghanistan is in the news nowadays. Every day you switch on television, there is Afghanistan. You see, when Bangladesh split from Pakistan, I was in Karachi, and all communication stopped. If I wanted to send a letter to my parents, I had to post it to England or some other country, and from there the letter used to be forwarded. And those days there was no this smartphone. Uh, the communication was very bad. If you wanted to book on call, it took three days before you got the line. And even when you got the line, it would be so bad, you could hardly hear the voice on the other side, and the line would cut off, and they say, hello, hello, and the line is dead. Again, you have to tell the operator, please, I could not speak. And again, another two days. But after waiting for months, when we saw that even the Red Cross, they came, I think, after a year or so uh, to help in the repatri repatriation process. But I, along with, uh, I had a relation, uh, his family, uh, we were uh, able to be smuggled out of Karachi. We were huddled into a truck covered uh, with uh, fodder, you know, straw and hay. So it gives the impression there is uh, nothing inside other than hay and straw. So from Karachi, we traveled all the way to Kandahar which is the border town between Pakistan and Afghanistan. We reached there after two days and two nights. And we were helped by the Pathans, you know, the tribesmen. So when we crossed the border, they used to, I'm sure, they gave bribe to the Pakistani border security and all that. <clears throat> but when he said, we have now entered the no man's land, oh, we just shouted, joy Bangla, you know, so we, such a relief that we are free. Because it's very dangerous to cross the border without any passport, without any documents. So we entered Kandahar. We reached there, I think, about quite late at night. We were taken to a hotel. And we were so happy. You know. People were shouting. They were telling the staff, we want coffee, tea. And they said, please, it's too late to give you tea and coffee. Go to sleep tomorrow morning. So next day, uh, people from the Indian uh, consulate, they came, they put us on a coach and then we traveled to Kabul, which is the capital of Afghanistan. So we were put up in a guest house, all the Bangladeshis who were coming and escaping from Pakistan. It was an arrangement between Afghanistan, India and Bangladesh. That, that's how these people will come, they will flee from Pakistan, please help them this way. So. We reached Kabul, we were put in a guest house and we were, I think I was there for about a couple of weeks. Every morning we used to go to the Indian embassy and to see uh, whether our name has come out for our flight to Delhi. So there were so many other Bengalis also there in Kabul. And Kabul was a beautiful place. I loved it so much. I even saw uh, two Indian films, uh, uh, Apna Desh and maybe some one other film, I don't remember. So, Kabul, we stayed for a couple of weeks, we had to wait for our turn, and then finally we flew from Kabul to Delhi by Ariana Airlines, Afghan Airlines. When we landed uh, at Delhi, then the Bangladesh embassy, they came to receive us. They took, took over, and they took us in a guest house, and we stayed there one night in a guest house in Delhi. And uh, next day, they took us to the embassy and they gave us 100 rupees. They said, you will have to go uh, to Bangladesh, you have to cross the border, you have to travel by train. And maybe one day we will ask you to return the money, but they never asked us to return the money. So 100 uh, rupees, those, uh, rupees those days was a lot. Anyway, so I had a family with me who had relations in Kolkata. I stayed in that house for two days. Then instead of traveling by train 
from after we arrived in uh, Delhi, uh, in, uh, we arrived in Kolkata, we stayed for three days. I didn't go to Bangladesh by train, I flew to Bangladesh. And when I arrived in Dhaka, the capital, my father mother came to the tarmac right up to the aircraft to receive us. See? So it was a big, big happy occasion. So I saw my family after nearly two years, you know. So my father, mother, and my three brothers were there. So that was the day, you know, one of memorable days, you know, that I came back to an independent, free Bangladesh. Oh, brilliant. Oh, you look quite youthful. Can you tell me a little bit about how you actually managed to stay this young? <laughs> how old are you now, if you don't mind telling us? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm running uh, 72. I'll, I'll be 73 uh, after a few months. Oh, yeah. Going through your memo, yes. uh, that age is quite a very vulnerable age, prone to diseases and so on. Yeah. But uh, here you've been uh, battling with cholesterol and other health issues. But I see you are staying fit and looking young. What is the secret behind this evergreen look? <laughs> well, I take care of myself, you know, simple as that, you know. Health is wealth, you know. What's the point having money in your bank account when you're lying sick in bed, you know? And for the last 23 years, I am single. I have nobody to take care of me. So, I was diagnosed with cholesterol about 30 years back. Uh, the consultant told me that you have to take medication for the rest of your life for cholesterol and also triglyceride. And just uh, within the last five years, I've also got type 2 diabetes. So I'm taking medication. I take about 17 tablets every night. I do moderate exercise. I used to jog for about a mile, but I slipped and I fell on the pavement just two, three times. Then I thought, no, it's too dangerous, you know. Start walking. So every day, if the weather is nice, I go for a walk about a mile. And on top of that, every evening before my dinner, I do freehand exercise in my kitchen. My kitchen is very big. So I do freehand exercise for about 15, 20 minutes. Then I have my food. And then I have better appetite, you know. So I have medication. I have exercise. And the other thing is that I follow a good diet. You know, I don't indulge in having fatty food, you know. And no sugary food, no fatty food, you know. And doctor told me once in a while you can have biryani. And I love biryani very much. Once a week I have pulao and uh, chicken um, or mutton curry. And I am a very good cook. People who have tasted my cooking, they said, Iftikar, you cook better than women. And even women complimented me. And talking about my looks, I get compliments every few days from women and also from men. Iftikar. You don't look. How come you're? You know, I said, look, this is. Maybe I have got nobody to nag me at home. Maybe I don't have any stress. You see, I don't even have a smartphone. <laughs> so I'm a happily divorced man, you know. And uh, God is kind, you know. I pray to God, you know. I'm I, I'm offering my prayers at least four times a day. The morning prayer, I, I find it difficult to get up at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning. But other than that, I I never miss my prayers. And my father, I also never saw him miss his prayers. So. This is something I say. So God is taking care of me. And I'm happy that, you know, and I eat what I like. I go wherever I like. I go to holiday. I've been to so many countries in the world. I've been to Australia. I've been to Canada, France, Spain, Italy. Uh, I go to Tanzania. I've been to Tanzania, I think, f five times. And hopefully, if after COVID is over, I'll go to visit. Tanzania is a beautiful country. I visit the safari parks there. So I enjoy traveling. I enjoy having good food, uh, good company, very difficult to find. <laughs> oh, yes. Brilliant. Amazing. Uh, you're looking very good. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate this. Uh, we see that uh, from you, your mainstream of actually promoting, you actually ended up deviating and uh, moving into singing. <laughs> yes. Can you tell us how that came about? Yes, people told me that, look, uh, Iftika, you, you have a good voice. Why don't you promote yourself? You spend so much of time, so much of money, energy promoting other people. 
And I said, why not? So I practiced. All the songs that I have on YouTube, I got about almost nearly 200,000 viewing of my songs, you know. So I trained myself. Nobody trained me to sing these songs. I've sang in four genres. I've sang in Bengali, uh, modern songs. Bengali, of course, is my mother tongue. Neer choto khatine Akash to baro Neer choto khatine Akash to baro He mon bala ka mor Ajana rao bhane Jan chalo pakha mele dharo खतीने आकाश तो बरो चादरों खारे ओए आकाशेरोगा चादरों खारे शेरुगाय जनो आलो कोले धोनी तो वो प्रेमेरु को गीता लिखे जा शुद्धूर पिया शिपा का काफे धरो धरो ये मन गाला का मुंह अजना रावणे जान चलो then I have sang Tagore songs, songs written by, composed by Ramindranath Tagore, our poet, national poet. Songs composed by poet Nazrul. He was known as a rebel poet. 
the, the British uh, put him in a jail because his uh, poems were so fiery, you know. That's why he came to be known as a rebel poet. So now, uh, Nazrul is, uh, Islam is been buried in Bangladesh. He's the national poet of Bangladesh. I sang uh, his song, then I also sang Hindi songs, and Hindi is not my mother tongue. So I trained myself, I perfected my pronunciation. So when I sing Hindi songs, people will not know that I'm Bengali speaking, because my pronunciation people can tell, you know. So, to take out 12 albums from Kolkata, I had to travel about 12, 15 times from London to go to Kolkata, such a long distance, about 10,000 miles, and stay in Kolkata in a hotel, and then do this recording. And the people who also collaborated with me, they were all professionals. I got very good music arranger. Uh, Rahul Chatterjee is one, Shamrat Gua is another one. Then I was very fortunate to get a good vocalist, uh, Sharmishta. Uh, she's a very, very talented singer. You have heard her songs. Uh, so I made this, and my recording company, Raga, they brought out most of my albums. So when I listened to my songs, after breakfast every day, I put the headset on and I listen to my songs on laptop. I tell myself that I'm the best singer in the whole world. <laughs> I love my songs and I listen to my songs. You know, music is the best therapy. When you listen to music, you don't have to understand the language. I have one uh, fan, uh, she's in Tanzania. She doesn't understand, uh, you know, her name is Naomi. She has complimented me on YouTube for my songs, that she liked it so much, you know, my voice is so good. So, to get a compliment from uh, Africa, from an African woman, <laughs> amazing stuff. So, music is a universal language. You don't have to understand the language. Listen to the music, that will make you feel good. You know, like, I don't understand some of the music coming from South America or Africa, you know. You know, uh, Salif Kaita is uh, my favorite singer, and he, he's uh, from uh, Mali. Uh, there's another singer, Isudana, Isudanaya, he's from West Africa. So, I dig music. And of course, I, I like uh, Western music. I like the singers uh, in the West, um, Michael Jackson, Madonna, um, what is this? Uh, James Brown, you know, I like James Brown very much. Uh, I liked Barry White, he was also very my singer. So, for me, music is 
the most beautiful thing, you know. And uh, you see, you, you cannot sing uh, unless you have the talent. So, this is a talent, you know. You get it from God. And for me, music is a very sacred thing. I cannot sing when people are walking around and they say, if they can, can you please? No. When I'm going to sing, I have to focus completely on the song. So that's why I don't enjoy doing live performance. Because nowadays, when you're singing uh, in a public, I did do, 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 perform here in Luton Library, but people not so attentive. Sometimes they'll be talking. And, oh. so it's a very sacred thing. It's like offering prayer. It's a spiritual thing. So when you listen to music, you will feel that the divine power is working. So I'm blessed for that. God has given me this talent and today I've got such a large viewing on YouTube and it is still counting, you know, 200,000, one day possibly I will not be in this world. It may surpass 200,000, who knows. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, wonderful having you here. Uh, thank you very much for talking to yeah. you. And I, I normally don't enjoy giving uh, interviews, but I could not resist you. You know, you, oh. you are a good man. <laughs> thank you, thank oh, you very much. Yes. Thank you.